Hello and welcome to Horror 101. I'm Paul. And I'm Dave. And this time we are talking about The Cabin in the Woods, which will be our final our final episode for, well, at least for this year. Mm. So Dave, you had never seen The Cabin in the Woods before, correct? No. In my case, I was around for when this movie was being made, shown in trailers, and premiered around the time, but... It was kind of a case with its advertising and whatnot of it was a horror flick and it didn't really seem to have a concept to it. And it was kind of like, eh, this is not my jam, so I don't want to see it. Yeah, so this was originally supposed to release in October of 2009. Mm. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, MGM... Um, was having financial difficulties. And I think there was also part of it where they were like, we don't really know how to market this movie because it's kind of weird and it's not kind of a typical horror movie. That and it's kind of the case of if you've exposed too much, you expose the big surprise that the movie has. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Uh, so it was re it eventually got released in 2011, uh, namely because Chris Hemsworth got this little role called Thor. And they were like, well, that solves the marketing for us. Oh, yes. Because I remember seeing him in the film, and it's like, huh, this is, must have been one of his early films. And then I did a little bit of digging and looked into it, and it was like, oh, made it then, but released it then. It's like, wait, why is that? And then I saw that he was in the movie, and it was like, no, that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so basic premise of this is there is this, like, secret underground laboratory, and there's a bunch of them all over the world. Like, we see one in Japan. We see one in... Well, we, we know of the existence of one in Japan, of one in Sweden, of... Um, I forget. There's a bunch of other ones. I think there's one in, like, Madrid. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them all around the world. And basically, they have to sacrifice uh, teenagers to, like, the, these ancient uh, gods in to placate them so they won't destroy the world. And we find out that the ones in America are the last uh, hope of, of completing this. We don't know how often they have to do this. I don't know if they, I don't think they ever actually say, like if it's every year or if it's like every 10 years or what. Yeah, they don't go into too many specifics about how often it needs to be done. Yeah, so we're seeing the the folks who are, are the last kind of hope for humanity, even though they don't really know it. Um, and they have to, you have to like kill them. Like each, each person has to, who dies has to like fulfill like a specific archetype. So there's like, there's the whore and there's the athlete and there's the fool. And then there's like the, I forget what the other one is. I think it's like the smart person kind of thing. Um, uh, scholar, I believe is what they use. Yes. The scholar. And then, uh, the virgin can either live or die as long as nobody else outlives them. So it's a fun little concept. We get the because like they have this underground layer, and they're like the people in the in this case they're in a cabin in the woods, obviously. And there's like mm -hmm. they have like all these different things laying around in the cabin, and they have to like select how they're going to die without knowing it. So like there's the chance that they could get a merman who one of the guys in the lab really wants to happen. Yeah, it's, it's so hard to get the merman picked out. It's just, and the, it was so close. So he, close to it, but he just never blew the conch. He had the conch in his hand and everything. <laughs> um, and, and then, like, these people have to die, and then that satiates these ancient gods. And it's a good time. They pump, like, these pheromones and different, like, drugs in to make them act in certain ways. And, yeah, it's just a good time. And it has a fun ending, which we'll get to at the end. But Yes, with all that sort of stuff. What? But it was definitely interesting with sort of seeing how the story begins and you get inklings of how the corporation works and their thoughts and ideas of all the tech machinery and effect that has to go into it to get things to pan out in that certain way. And then I didn't notice on the first watch, but it was a case I went back because there was a scene or two I wanted to double check for points and whatnot that 
it started to do the typical stereotyping of it. And it was just like, oh my god, like, how I did not recognize this when it first started, I am mildly amazed, but literally, they turned the cab people into the base characters that they are, and it was just, it's mildly insulting, but also mildly amazing, because it brings the concept of a horror film completely full circle in some cases that this story's concept gives you an idea of how every single horror movie is made. Yeah, no, they do a really good job of, like, slowly transitioning them from, like, real people into, like, these stereotypes. Yeah, it's a, it's a great little kind of trick that they pull. Um, it's, it's just, like, a really good screenplay. It really is. And just... Even when the veneer starts to fall away in certain cases, they either don't realize it, they're too affected by how the company's been messing with them, but it gives those additional effects of the one particular scene I'm going to mention is trying to drive away from the cabin. They can't drive through a tunnel because it's been collapsed, but they see it looks like an easy jump. They can easily jump across and get out of there until you remember... This is a secret government organization, and they have methods for keeping you inside. In this case, an invisible electrical wall that he just slaps right into. And just, ooh, I knew it was going to happen, but boy, that is brutal. Yeah, because they set that up earlier when they're driving up to the cabin, because we see, like, a eagle or something hit that and die. And it's like, huh, birds survived, but they did not. Only one way inside. Got it. Yeah, I know it's there's there's so much of this where they do such a good job of like setting things up and then paying them off. Mm -hmm. It's it's almost like the people who wrote this movie really like horror movies, but also are kind of like they're kind of stupid. Yeah, yeah, but in some cases it really can't be helped. And it was definitely interesting when I got the movie going and whatnot. It had a couple of titles sort of labeling it. And it was kind of like suspense, horror, and whatnot. And after your first description of horror comedy, and it's like, huh, this isn't really advertising the comedy of this particular movie, but it smacks you right in the face with the comedy most all the way through. Yeah, I think it, the thing is, like, there aren't... With a few exceptions, there aren't, like, really big jokes. Like, it's just kind of, like, a lot of characters, like, they... Almost, they don't necessarily know they're in a horror movie, but they kind of do. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm using the right word for it, but it's either dark or satirical comedy that parriates the whole film, but doesn't exactly sour it too much with like, ha ha, funny thing happened, uh, comedy sort of things. It's a case of either a person receiving comeuppance, uh, dark humor, or just generally funny things in the moment depending on the situation and it's a marvelous mix of the two yeah no it does a very good job of of being funny but also being scary at the same time mm -hmm. like still it's it's a comedy but it's also a horror movie it balances that horror comedy very well um so did you recognize anyone in this movie because there there are a couple of people here that you might recognize from buffy yeah. and angel <laughs> Yes, with uh, those sorts of things. So get the obvious thing out of the way. Again, my apologies if I get the name wrong, because there always seems to be some jurisdiction, but there's uh, Chris Hemworth, I believe Chris Hemsworth, is, yeah. Is bestly known for being the Thor character, part of the Marvel movies, and all around, oh my gosh, superstar. Um, in that sort of case... And again, my apologies, I missed out on the specific names, but there was the actress within the Angel series that played one of the main characters that was in it as one of the scientists. Yes, Amy Acker, she was um, Illyria and Fred in Angel. Mm. And there's another one that you might not have noticed because he doesn't get a lot of screen time in this. Okay. Because the other particular thing, while looking back and doing a little bit of uh searching on this is there were the two 
uh, monitor people, and one of them supposedly had a fairly big calling within films and whatnot, and had a couple of big roles after this one, or before this movie as well. It was kind of one of the bigger names that was in it. The name escapes me, however. I'm assuming you're thinking of Bradley Whitford, who for most people would probably be best known for his role in um, uh, The West Wing, where he played Josh Lyman. Mm, yes. Yeah. That's actually not who I was thinking of. Um, there's an actor in this named Tom Lank, who you probably... You oh, might... I think I just got it. It was the case of it took me a second to kind of run through the films and the particular moments, but there's additionally... Uh, character within the office that is another character from Angel that is pretty much unmistakable after you kind of hear his voice. From Angel? Oh, because the person I was thinking of was Tom Lank, who plays Andrew in Buffy. Oh, he does pop up in Angel, I think, though. He also does a couple of uh, episodes in Angel. He does, yes. In my brain. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't sure if you would catch him, because he only has, like, Maybe two scenes in the movie. But nevertheless, he won the pot, so congrats to him. It's true. He was the co-winner of the pot. Uh, speaking of uh, pot, we have the character Marty. Yes, who, yes. Who's my favorite. Yeah, kind of the marvelous case of once you he gets introduced, it's quite amazing that you figured for one of the biggest characters within the story, he doesn't exactly change too much. But it's the marvelous case of he's one hell of a pothead. I I do love how like at one point in the movie they like the scientists are all like whatever he's smoking is really fucking with our stuff. Which is why yeah, kind of the case of it was interesting to kind of go back and double check on things within the movie because it's one of the things I didn't realize that it hinges on him a little bit. Totally. All the particular things within the film, it's like uh, one of the characters gets affected by the gas. We need to split up. It's like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. He's just standing back there. It's like, what? (laughs) Yeah, no, because he's so fucking high that they can't affect him. And he's the only one thinking clearly, even though he's really stoned. (laughs) And And it's also a case of he's one of the one of the things I thought about was one of the biggest things that kind of affects him is either someone in the office or one of the things they use is a voice that he only seems to hear that tells him what to do or how to affect certain things leads him on and it's kind of the case of ooh, that's the thing that's gonna get him isn't it yeah i do love how he's like supposed to be the fool but he's like the smartest one sometimes which made me laugh Mm mm-hmm that actor was also in a show called Dollhouse that was also uh, created by Joss Whedon, which, from memory, was actually quite good. Although, I feel like it kind of missed some of the things it should have kind of dealt with. But, anyway, mm-hmm. uh, it sounds like you had a good time with this movie. It was definitely interesting, but I think the other particular thing that was definitely interesting uh, seeing is when the kids from the horror flick actually get themselves into the big corporation and their inner workings because all the crazy monsters and effects that they have on hand and once they decide to get the party started in there it's one hell of a party yeah so uh marty and oh what's her name i can't remember that character's name now um what's her name what's her name what's her name uh dana they manage to get, they go through the grave of the zombies that have come out to kill them, and then they manage to get into, like, this underground facility where all the scientists are, and they manage to unleash, like, hundreds of these different monsters. There's the, we finally get to see the merman. He kills um, Bradley Whitford's character in a nice little <laughs> twist. Um, and then there's, like, a giant snake, and there's, like, werewolves, and there's well, basically every kind of like, horror monster you could think of is in there. Pretty much. It was kind of a case of what were the kind of strange, interesting ideas that nobody has actually really made a, th- a horror film around. Yeah, it's 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 super fun, and you see these, like, the uh, military guys going in, and they're like, oh, fuck. 
because they turn into this hallway that's just covered in blood and they're like fuck we're dead yeah just a marvelous case of you're standing in a room with six elevators along the side all of them ding get ready for the slaughter yeah and then they manage to make their way through the facility and they make it to the um the the kind of like temple thing at the bottom and then we meet our final character the director uh did you recognize who played the director the face was familiar, but I couldn't exactly say if I knew her from any specific show or movie at the at the time I watched it. Ah, okay. Uh, it's Sigourney Weaver, who would be best known for the Aliens franchise. Ah. Yes. And she basically says that, like, you have to kill um, Marty in order to save the world to Dana. And then she pulls her gun and, like, points it at Marty. And then a werewolf attacks her. And then they kind of just decide, that, like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> Let's just get high and let the world end. Yeah, humanity isn't exactly having too good of a time with all the shit that's been going on. Let's give somebody else a go. Yeah, I love the ending because it's so it's so nihilistic, but also at the same time, it's kind of like, it's oddly sweet. Because it's like, they're, they're gonna like doom humanity, but it's just like these two friends that are just sharing a joint. Yeah, in most of the cases. And I'm trying to think back on other particular things within the film that were interesting. I think the only one thing that we never commented on is, oh man, Japan. Japan is definitely <laughs> the crown king of all the particular stuff that it decides to do. Releasing a ghost in the middle of a all-girls uh, school. And then we see later where the girls are like holding hands and like dancing around the ghost. The evil is defeated. We place the evil spirit inside of this happy frog. Hooray! <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Uh, so, I take it you enjoyed you enjoyed the film? I was definitely pleasantly surprised. Though, there was the one or two moments that kind of left me a little bit, oh my god, typical horror movie. Yeah, but it was all for the case of, hey, this is a horror movie. It kind of has to have the uh, tricks of the trade to it. Yeah, and I think they do a good job of kind of incorporating them and, and making it, you know, uh, more palatable maybe to an audience who, who won't enjoy those. Mm -hmm. So um, there have been rumors about a sequel, but obviously we've never got one. I kind of hope that obviously you can't do a direct sequel to this. Yeah, no, that'd be a bit tricky. You know, the world ends. But I kind of want to see, like, a prequel. Yeah, other sort of runs of uh, stuff happening. Maybe other companies' runs of what sort of stuff they go through. Other countries, like, let me see what happened in, like, Madrid or something. Or go back in time and do, like, a 60s one or something. <laughs> There are there are ideas to it. Yeah, I would love to see a sequel, but we've yet to get one. And considering it's been, you know, uh, more than 11 years, I don't think we're going to. Yeah. Which is sad, yeah. but it, it is a good standalone horror film. Mm. I think it's kind of the question of how do how good did it do the at the box office at the time? And does it kind of have a decent standing nowadays? Because as it sits, it was kind of... I heard about it, I know of its title, but it's kind of a case of I hadn't watched it until now. Uh, so it on a budget of $30 million, it did $66.5 million at the box office, which it probably broke even at the box office, but I feel like it did well on home video, so I feel mm. like there would be enough interest in, in a sequel, but it would also be... Yeah, it would be. It's difficult because you don't really have a character that you can bring back to kind of link the films together. They have to kind of be standalone. Yeah, in those sort of cases, especially. So you can't you can't use Chris Hemsworth to sell the sequel kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. It definitely helped in this movie's case at around the time. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, so yeah, that was Cabin in the Woods. And that completes our, our little mini-series of Horror 101, Dave. Yes, I have been somewhat educated. So, I'm going to ask, what has been your favorite of the movies we've done? 
it kind of sits a little bit in the tier list. There sadly is a case that there's the one or two movies that I remember watching, but I can't specifically recall them from the list that you gave me. But the big three with what you made me watch is, as it sits with the very top of the list, it kind of has to be Cabin in the Woods. Because with its story idea, the effects that they went with, and just how everything sort of panned out with it, it gives a nice storybook uh, functionality to it of just opening it up, seeing all the stuff in there, and marveling at it, but it still closes the book on it and books and bookends it so very well. But it then also falls to the other two, which kind of fight for second and third place, which is Nightmare on Elm Street for starting up with the Freddy franchise, and of course, Poltergeist for just the amazing work that was done with the amazing minds that they had and just having a pinpoint of that specific amount of horror when it was first sort of developing out from that sort of point. It was good historical uh, watches for both of those two. Yeah, no. Um, so I would probably put Cabin in the Woods as the best one we've seen. Um, followed up by probably Nightmare. I'm going to... See, the tricky part for me is number three. Because mm. um, I want to put Poltergeist, but I also want to put Happy Death Day. Oh, yeah, that's true. Because Poltergeist is a classic, and I really love that movie. But Happy Death Day was a movie that I didn't really remember, and I really ended up enjoying. But okay, the bottom so of the list is definitely The Grudge. Because I didn't really enjoy that again mm. and again it had its occasional moments and it was definitely understandable for the horror it was going through but it's also the case that it's one of the particular horror things i was kind of introduced to and it wasn't my first introduction to it so it was a case of i know of it but it's not exactly the main pioneer of that within my mind or even within story standards yeah, no, I... Yeah. Yeah, uh... Yeah. This has been a fun little run, and uh, who knows, maybe we'll do it again next year. Yeah, it'll be interesting, especially with the stuff that's coming out nowadays. Oh, Five Nights at Freddy's is out, Dave. Yes. Yes, it is. And apparently it's really bad. Anyway. Well, on the critics, the audience supposedly are saying it's fairly good, but that might be for another reason. Alrighty, well, until next time, I'm Paul. And I'm Dave.